This is Carrie Walker reporting for Global Medical News from the annual meeting of the American Society for Bone Mineral Density in Denver. Joining me is Dr. Nelson Watts, the director of the University of Cincinnati's Bone Health and Osteoporosis Center. Dr. Watts discussed his experience using FRACS in clinical practice. Dr. Watts, thank you for joining me. Um, can you tell me how FRAX is useful in the clinic for rheumatologists and for doctors who treat women with osteoporosis, osteopenia? I think the new guidelines from the National Osteoporosis Foundation that came out last year are useful in deciding when to use FRAX. And it's basically when you need help deciding should you treat or not to treat. So in a patient who's at very low risk of fracture, say they have a T-score of minus one or above, which is considered normal, you don't need FRAX. For patients who have either a clinical diagnosis of osteoporosis, they've had a hip or a spine fracture, or their bone density is minus 2.5 or below in the spine or in the hip, that's osteoporosis and you don't need any additional information. But it's the large group of women that are, have bone density T-scores between minus 1 and minus 2.5 where having this additional information really helps. And basically what FRAX does is incorporate some additional known risk factors into um, sort of the equation to help you determine which um, women might be at, a, at risk for fractures, is that correct? That's right. Uh, probably the most important one and the one that applies to everybody is age. So at the same level of bone density, fracture risk goes up fairly substantially decade by decade. But there are a number of other risk factors that don't apply to everyone, but certainly are important for those who have a parent with a hip fracture or they've had a prior fracture as an adult or they smoke, uh, heavy use of alcohol, have rheumatoid arthritis or use lupus corticoids. Now, we usually talk about osteoporosis in women, but um, this, the, the FRAX tool actually applies to men as well? Yes, it's estimated that about 20% of people in this country with osteoporosis are men. And we recently had some, um, some additions or updates to the FRAX algorithm. Can you talk about those? There have been some changes, and for the person who goes on today, it's probably not going to be very obvious, but there was a miscalculation in the fracture risk that was discovered last October and corrected. And there's some really encouraging new data that fracture risks, age-related fracture risks, have been going down over the last decade for men and even more so for women. So as of September 7, 2009, FRAX 3.0 for the U.S. was released, and that results in slightly lower fracture rates, particularly for younger men and women. That changed too much for men and women 70 and over. Okay, so I guess the bottom line is for clinicians who aren't sure exactly what to do for um, certain patients, this is a tool that they can use to get some additional um, input, but it's not something that replaces clinical decision making. Well, I think that you know, on, on the basis of the NOF guidelines, you sort of plug in the numbers for fracture, you come out with a 10-year risk for hip fracture, 10-year risk for major fracture, turn back to the NOF guidelines and say you should treat if the hip fracture risk is 3% or more, or the major fracture risk is 20%. Or more. But I think on that initial assessment, you need to consider things that aren't captured in FRAX. So if the patient has intermittent corticosteroid therapy, or they're on a drug like aromatase inhibitors that cause bone loss, then the FRAX numbers really underestimate their likelihood of having a fracture. But I also find it useful in what I call a dynamic sense. The patient gets a fairly low fracture risk based on their circumstances today, but things might change, and you can easily show that patient how their risk would change if their mother had a hip fracture, or if they had a fracture, or what their risk will be, say, five years or 10 years down the road. So I think it's helpful in letting people look at the future, and for some people appreciate that they're really in good shape and they may never need to worry about osteoporosis, and others to think, well, maybe in the next five years or so, I'm gonna to need to do something about it. This is Carrie Wachter reporting for Global Medical News.